Vinton Cerf has served as vice president and chief internet visionary for Google since 2005. He basically travels the world talking about the power and the future of the internet in bettering lives of societies. He's also an active Google public face in the internet world. Vinton is now in South Africa. And uh, of course, as I say, he's Google's vice president and he's here with us in studio. It is so nice to have you. Welcome to Morning Live. Yeah, well, this is lovely to be back again. Yeah, back again. And I'm going to talk about that. But what we're going to do is first look at that. There you go. I mean, that's one of the inventions of Google. Google Earth, Google Map. You've come all the way from Heathrow, landed here at the SABC building. I mean, this is just incredible technology. So that who the, would have the, thought? The, the group that made that uh, is pretty spectacular, and they are still out inventing. They're doing more and more to create a platform that lets other people put their geographically indexed information into that presentation framework. It makes the value of their information far more uh, powerful because it's presented in this flexible and facile way. Yeah. Now... We, we, we talk about the fact that this is certainly not your first time to South Africa. In fact, you came here for the first time in 1974 with this idea of something before the Internet. Talk to us about this. So, first of all, I arrived in 1974 with a team of people to demonstrate the predecessor to the Internet. It was called the ARPANET, and it was sponsored by the American Defense Department. We were testing a technology called packet switching, which is sort of the antithesis to what the telephone system used, which was called circuit switching, and I'm sure that's overly geek for everybody, so don't worry about it. It was just a new idea, a different way of using communication for computer-to-computer -computer, uh, uh, chatting. And so we showed that system in operation in 1974. Ironically, that same year, my partner Bob Kahn and I published a paper describing what the Internet would look like yeah. with an unlimited number of networks all interconnected together. And of course, here we are in 2013. This is the 30th anniversary of turning on the internet. It's been running since 1983. Next year will be the 40th anniversary of the publication of the first design paper. So this has been going on for a very long time. People here in Joburg, at least a small subset of them, got a glimpse of what the future was going to look like 40 years ahead of time. That's incredible. Oh, it's incredible when you think about how far we've come. Did you ever believe when you presented that paper, and that was, that was in the, on the 10th of September 1973, you presented this paper of what you explained to us. Did you ever believe that sitting here in the year 2013 that the Internet would be what it is today? Of course. I mean, oh, you knew it? Well, I mean, well look, I, would be I wouldn't be telling the truth if I said we knew exactly <laughs> everything that happened. But we knew at the time that this was incredibly powerful technology. And our experience with the predecessor network from 1969 to 1973 cemented our belief that this could become an extremely powerful global scale technology. And so we have all worked towards that end for decades now. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the evolution of the Internet. I mean, because you know, it all started out pretty small, then it just grew, and it grew, and it That's grew, right. and it grew, and it grew. I mean, is the, is the capacity endless? Uh, well, it's not infinite, but we've done some things to make it last for a long, long time to come. We actually ran out of internet addresses. It's kind of like running out of telephone numbers in uh, February of 2011. Mm. But fortunately, in 1996, we had uh, collectively designed a new format for the internet address space using 128 bits of addresses. That's 340 trillion, trillion, trillion addresses. That's enough to last until after I'm dead, then it's somebody else's problem. So we have a new IP version 6, which is now being rolled out in parallel with the older IP version 4. So we have capacity to spare. That's amazing. Give us a glimpse into the future, because, I mean, I would never have imagined a while ago. I mean, when I was at university, I was still going to a library. Now, I don't even think people know what the inside of a library looks like. I mean, this is my library. This, this is it. That's exactly Google, right. whatever you want, the answer is there. Well, what does the future look like? So, first of all, I hope that we do get to the point where all the library's contents are uh, accessible through that little pad. There are still a lot of things in libraries that are still locked up in paper, and Google has a whole program to try to scan all that information and make it accessible online. Meanwhile, more and more content is being created in digital form, and so that's what many of us see when we go onto the net and use Google to find things. This is just the beginning. First of all, uh, there is now coming what's called the Internet of Things. These are devices and appliances that you have around the house, things they offer, uh, appliances for entertainment, uh, for cooking, for 
cleaning, for environmental control, and for security. All these things are becoming internet capable. They're being networked. They can be remotely accessed. They can be controlled. They can report their status. Third parties can offer services that will manage these things for you. You can imagine somebody saying, I'll manage all your entertainment for you. Tell me what you like. Go to the web page, click on the music and the, and the movies you want, and I'll mm -hmm. see to it that they end up in the right devices. All that stuff is coming. Yeah. The second thing that's happening is already happening is mobile and radio access, mobile access to the Internet. The third thing that's happening is in many places, and we hope here as well, increasing capacity using optical fiber in order to deliver really high-speed services. Google has invested a considerable amount of money in Kansas City. It's going to invest a similar kind of thing in Austin, Texas, and in Provo, Utah, to deliver one billion bit per second service to consumers in each city, in each home. Seems. And our idea here is in part to find out what happens when people have that kind of capacity on an end-to-end -end basis. To, just to give you an example, you can transmit one hour of video in 15 seconds when you're transmitting at a billion bits a second. So My a pre-recorded video is available like that. You know, video on demand is no longer streaming video. Mm. It's simply delivering the file yeah, instantly. Yeah, it's just a matter of... And then you play it back whenever you want to. Yeah. So that's all happening. Then it gets even more interesting. You, well, you heard the term artificial intelligence. For years, we've been trying to make machines smarter and smarter. Well, we're getting very close. For example, Google has a fleet of self-driving cars. There's a couple of dozen cars that have driven a half a million miles in San Francisco on their own you with can. no accidents. Oh my gosh. And of course, this is wonderful. If you happen to be blind, you couldn't drive. Yeah. <clears throat> now you can get in the car, tell it where you want it to go, and it goes. Uh, how about uh, another thing that's recently been in the news? It's called Google Glass. This is literally a computer that you wear like yes. a pair of glasses. It has a video camera, it has a microphone, it has a bone conduction speaker, and it is listening to your commands. So I can say, okay, Google, take a picture, and it will take a little picture. Or I can say, Google, and then I'll say uh, maybe uh, South Africa, or Google uh, best wines in Stellenbosch. Mm. It will, interpret, it will take my voice, turn it into text, use that to figure out what a query looks like on the Google system, come back and display the results in a little, uh, you know, the, the little tiny um, video camera or video display yeah. above my right eye. I can ask it for directions and it will show me the map yeah. in the display. Now, the thing that's important here is not just that little list of applications. What's really important is that we are bringing a computer into the environment that you're normally in. It sees what you see and it hears what you hear. And it has context. So if I say, where is the nearest Thai restaurant? That's a well-formed question as long as the Google Glass knows where it is at the time. So this is bringing computer power to our environment in the way that we normally interact with each other. We'll have conversations with our computers as well. It's unbelievable. We're going to take a break. Um, I want to know, firstly, what you're doing here in South Africa now. Um, now that I feel like I'm living in a science fiction movie um, and my car is waiting for me in the parking lot to take me home. Uh, let's take a break so I can absorb all of this. And I know you want to absorb this too.